Jen McRae. I don't know how I'm going to follow the hula hooper, but uh, <laughs> pretty cool. Yeah, thanks for having me. This is my first Skepticon, so I'm really excited to be here. Yeah. <laughs> that uh, I didn't realize PZ was giving a talk on genetics until I was on the plane here on Friday and I had sort of one of those like, oh no, we're going to wear the same dress to prom moments. Um, <laughs> we met up and we were actually pretty different talks. Um, I actually kind of wish my talk came before PZ's because mine's going to be more introduction to genetics and debunking some common misconceptions people have about it. So if any of you were sitting in his talk and like had no idea what's going on, maybe we can like get you up to speed after the fact now. But first, why learn about genetics? So I am a PhD student in genome sciences, University of Washington. I already think genetics is awesome. I mean, why wouldn't you want to know how life is regulated and made? I think that's the best question ever. But not everyone is a genetics nerd. Not everyone is like, oh, worm vulva, that's great. <laughs> but so I had to memorize that pathway in undergrad. I'm like, why are you guys so shocked by this? This is crazy. <laughs> Um, so I want to sort of convince you guys why all of you should learn about genetics even if you're not a biologist. So first, science literacy. I mean, I don't think I have to convince a skeptical audience why this is important, but genetics especially is a rapidly expanding field. The structure of DNA was discovered 1953. Human Genome Project wasn't finished till 2003. There are plenty of people in this room who probably haven't had a biology class since before one or both of those things. And you <laughs> I won't make you raise your hands, don't worry. <laughs> but you know, genetics is a really rapidly expanding field. It's one of those things where when I finish my PhD, if I become a professor and 20 years from now I look back, I'll probably be doing something totally different than what I'm doing now. And because of that, it's really hard to keep up to date, especially if you're not a biologist. And just an example of this, uh, this was a survey from 2008, and I'm, I'll get out of the way so you can actually see it, and it said that 49% of Americans think ordinary tomatoes do not have genes, but genetically modified tomatoes do. <laughs> I, you know, I have to, the number is actually higher in Europe, which surprised me. It's something like 59% think this, because um, they have more of a genetically modified food scare over there, actually, than here. Um, so I think this is a problem, obviously, since if you don't know why this is an issue, um, all living things have genes. Tomatoes are alive, despite what, like, a creation museum would tell you. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, you know, I've had this experience in my everyday life. Uh, when people ask what I'm studying, I usually just say genetics now, because I found when I say genome sciences, no one has any idea what I'm talking about. Um, I was actually golfing with my parents one day, and one of their friends was golfing with us, not a close friend, and they mentioned that I was a PhD student. And he's like, oh, what are you studying? I'm like, oh, I, I'm in the Department of Genome Sciences. And he's like, oh, so you study the little guy with the hat and the lawn. <laughs> no, that's, 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 you're not even pronouncing it right, it's a gnome. Not gene. Oh God. Yeah. <laughs> so this did happen. So and most people don't know what a genome is. So this is why I think it's important that we give a talk like this. But if that's not enough to convince you, um, you know, humans are kind of self-interested when research is done. To study yourself kind of gets funded a little more for a reason. Um, so one thing, human variation. I think a lot of people are interested. Why does every human in this room and on the planet look different from each other? Why do we have different eye colors and different skin colors and hair types and so much differences between individuals? Uh, what's the basis for some genetic disease? Why are some people more predisposed to things than others? And the question I'm really interested in, that's what actually I do my research in, is what makes us human? Whoa, that was <laughs> what makes us human? You know, what makes us different from other primates? What, what are the genes that differentiate us, make us special? But I think the most important one is nerd cred, honestly. Um, you know, you want to be able to have an intellectual debate about how does variation within the X gene cause so many different powers? Like, it's really hard. Yeah, a, or, more importantly to me, how is magical ability inherited in the world of Harry Potter? Like, <laughs> we have like, huge family trees, we can like, we could do a great study on the black family, you know, there are lots of squibs in there, I think that'd be, it's great. 
But, you know, I, I'm pandering to you guys, this is easy. <laughs> But why, so why be skeptical about genetics? Well, for one, a lot of people think they understand inheritance. Um, so this looks like it kind of makes sense, you know? Mom, dad blends into a baby. <laughs> it, it's really cute, when I first saw this I laughed, but <laughs> genetics is actually a lot more complicated than this. And people have this idea of genetics that, you know, when you look at your parents, you have traits from both of them and you generally consider yourself a blend, and you don't really think of traits being dominant or recessive, or the complexities and how certain things are inherited. People sort of see genetics as averaging traits when you're coming from offspring, which is sort of what this is saying. And I also think that's why, um, you know, genetics in popular media like X-Men or Harry Potter seems sort of right, but not quite when you actually try to explain it. Uh, we have had lots of debates with my other genetics students on how magic actually is inherited in, in Harry Potter, and our conclusion is that J.K. Rowling just did something genetic-y, but it's really not real. So this is a very serious topic to us. <laughs> but you also have to be skeptical because the media loves sensationalist stories. I don't have to tell you guys this, <laughs> but uh, if you can't read this, it's kind of low. It says, new rule for science journalism. If your article can be summarized as no, don't write it. <laughs> Um, and, you know, especially with genetics, it's, people have this interest in genetics, and so when there's some new study that seems really crazy, it's going to get way hyped up. So it's good to know what sort of things to look for to avoid that hype. But my take-home message for this is genetics is complicated. And so I have this X X XKCD comic here um, about Punnett Square. Yeah, who doesn't like XKCD? Come on. All right. um, it says, trivia, 30% of biologists' first dates disintegrate into making Punnett squares. That's totally false. It's like 90%, but yeah, that's... <laughs> but I put this up here because I remember when I was in seventh grade and I was first learning about genetics, I was doing my first Punnett square, and I thought, oh my god, this is awesome. You can explain life itself with these really simple mechanisms. This is so cool. And then, you know, next year I learned a little bit more about genetics and a little more. And then I go off to college, I'm working, learning about molecular genetics and now I'm my PhD. And I'm just learning it is not simple at all. Um, there's plenty of genetics I still don't understand. Um, hopefully we'll have time for questions in the end. I might not be able to answer all of them. I probably definitely won't be able to. Um, but it's really complicated. So when you see news stories oversimplifying things, you need to take it with a grain of salt. Because even the geneticists usually don't quite understand what's going on yet. So yes, today I will teach you how to genetics. <laughs> Does anyone know who this guy is? Yeah, Mendel, good job. I don't have to teach you that much, that's good. <laughs> so really brief intro, intro to things to make sure everyone's on the same page. And some of these are some misconceptions, so I just want to go over it. So when you're reading that article, you know the basics. So DNA, molecule that contains the genetic instructions for life. As you probably know, it's made up of a, T, C, and G, which are the letters. And so what happens is you get this sequence that's basically the instructions that says, hey, put a pore in the membrane here, or make a protein that copies more DNA here. And they basically spell out these instructions for the cell on how to make things. Though I w there is one misconception. Uh, if anyone's a Jonathan Colton fan, um, there's a song called, yeah. I was gonna try to play it, but that's too high tech for me. I'm a biologist. Um, <laughs> that's, uh, he has a song called, That's Called DNA. And one of my pet peeves when I'm listening to this song is he says it's in every cell of your body. But it's not true. It's not in red blood cells in mammals. I don't know if you knew that. Um, red blood cells actually get rid of their nucleus because it makes them more streamlined to go through your blood vessels and they're flexible. But birds do have them, so it's not all cells get rid of them. <laughs> so there, maybe you already learned something. <laughs> so what's a chromosome? So a chromosome is just when you take a single piece of DNA and you coil it up really tight with proteins and make it smaller. And this is because DNA is actually really long and it helps it pack into a little nucleus in your cell. So just to put that in perspective, uh, within one cell, if you lined up all of your DNA, it would be three meters long. And if you lined up all the DNA in your body, it would be enough to do 70 trips from the sun to earth and back. Yeah, so that's how much DNA is in you. So think about how narrow this is and how well packed it is to fit in one of your cells. And I also want to point out a misconception is, so you always see pictures of this like chromosomes where they're kind of in this X pattern, 
and this is pretty typical for how people imagine chromosomes, but these are actually only how chromosomes look when cells are about to divide, because they pack up even super tighter than because they want to make sure um, the right chromosomes go to the right cells, so it's better to be a little organized. But during most of the cell cycle, chromosomes are kind of these blobby things. This is a, a technique called FISH, it's fluorescent in situ hybridization, where basically you can dye all the different chromosomes different colors, and this is how your cell looks most of the time, well not the rainbow colors, but <laughs> the blobby chromosomes just sort of spread out because they need to be opened up so they can actually do their job and have proteins made from them. So what is a gene? A gene is a sequence of DNA that codes for a protein. The protein is part of the, uh, uh, the molecule in the cell that does the grunt work, basically. It's the one that's actually going to be doing any enzymatic chemical process. And so not all DNA codes for genes. Uh, one thing to remember is not, one gene does not always equal one trait. Uh, that's a big misconception a lot of people have. They say you have the gene for this or the gene for that. But there are a lot of traits that have dozens or maybe hundreds of genes that contribute to why you look or act a certain way. And one gene does not always equal one protein. Um, so there's a thing called alternative splicing, which is not this. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, you can't read this at all. So it says gene splicing. This is what happens when you play God. Awesome. <laughs> but this is not what alternative splicing is. Uh, I know, unfortunately. <laughs> Maybe one day. It's going to be my thesis. Uh, um, alternative splicing is when what PZ showed you, you have this length of DNA with the exons and introns. Do you remember this from last night? And instead of just cutting out the introns in a certain order, Sometimes you can skip certain introns and reorder. So this one's lacking the red one, and this one has all of them, and this one's lacking the green one, and you actually get different proteins from the same original gene. So pretty cool stuff. This is a, something people are looking into a lot more now. So what's an allele? Uh, actually, before I was, when I was writing this talk, I was uh, asking Twitter, like, what are some things you just don't understand? So a couple people were like, I just, what are alleles? I don't get it. Uh, something I hear about in my biology class is not clear. So allele is just a form of a gene. So what happens is um, you can have one gene, but there's slightly different types of it that basically do similar things. And the best example of this are actually blood types. I think this is what people are most familiar with, where A, B, and O are all different alleles. And so in this case, O is what we call an recessive allele because it only, the O phenotype, so the actual trait that's displayed, if you have the O blood type, is only shows up if you have two O's. Because if you have an A or a B, they override. Because what happens is in a dominant phenotype, it makes some sort of chemical characteristic where it doesn't really matter what, what the other one is because that's going to show up. So in this case, um, it adds things to your red blood cells, and that's, so it doesn't matter if O isn't adding anything, because A or B will add something, so you'll look A or B. And so A and B are also both considered dominant. And when you have A, B, that's considered codominance because both A and B are expressed together. Now there is a misconception that dominant means more frequent that I hear a lot, um, and this is not true. And I think the reason why people think this is because the example you get in all your biology classes are, is usually brown eyes and blue eyes, that brown eyes are dominant to blue eyes. Um, if you have the gene for brown and blue, your eyes are going to look brown. And when you look in the general population, like in the US, brown eyes are way more common. And so people think that dominant, yes, just taking over the population. But you know, it's not true when you go to Sweden. Um, so this is a percentage of light eyes in Europe. And you can see the distribution, just distribution here. And there are places in Europe where light eyes are way more common. So dominance is not always more frequent. And what's a genome? <laughs> not a gnome, <laughs> not a little mythical creature. Um, a genome is just all the DNA in a cell. So for humans, we have 46 chromosomes, and of those, it's 6 billion base pairs total. Um, it's 3 billion base pairs long, but you have two sets, one from your mom and dad, so you have six total. And you have about 25,000 genes. And I won't go, and this is actually, if you print out the genome in book form, this is how big it looks. Pretty cool. Yeah, it's, <laughs> all that's in you, <laughs> multiple times. And like PZ talked about yesterday, only about 1.5% of the genome is genes. I'm not really going to add anything else to that since I think he covered it pretty thoroughly, except this. I just want you to think about that for a second. Uh, that's, that's, no. It's not fair. It's not fair. This is, I think this is the creationist made this. I don't know. Yes. 
And finally, inheritance. Um, basically, what happens is you get 50% of your genes from mom and 50% from dad. This is not how inheritance <laughs> happens. Oh, Saturday morning breakfast. I'll let, you take, I'll let you figure that out for a second. It might take a while. <laughs> um, but it's not quite that cut and dry. There are some exceptions. Uh, for example, uh, your mitochondria in the cell, which are what produces the energies for your cell, um, that has its own genome, and that comes from your mom. It does not come from your dad. So you are technically slightly closely related to your mom. <laughs> and there are things called de novo mutations, which are basically mutations that are unique to you. They happen um, in sperm or eggs, and so you will be different from both your parents in those sites, and those do happen. So I'm going to have a pop quiz to see how my audience is doing on uh, their genetic knowledge. So pop quiz, uh, siblings share exactly 50% of their DNA. Who thinks this is true? Raise your hand. Oh, you guys are good. Okay. <laughs> I can't trick you. All right. This is only on average. So, God, you guys, I don't even want to explain this now. So there's... <laughs> And independent, whatever, Mendel's laws. Uh, so for like the couple people who raised their hands, sorry not to make you feel bad. Um, basically what happens is when you're making sperm and eggs, chromosomes do what they call independent assortment. So basically chromosome one doesn't care what chromosome two is doing and they'll go to different sides of the cell. And so you might get the chromosome from grandpa and your brother might get it from grandma. And it doesn't really matter. You're not gonna match up. But you could get the same one and they're actually be closely, more closely related to your sibling than 50% or less. And there's also a thing called recombination, which is where the chromosomes can trade genetic material, just making you even more diverse. And gene regulation, PZ also talked about this a little, but I just wanted to keep it in, um, because there's this misconception that even people who understand a little genetics, they know, they're like, oh, well, genes are turned on and off, right? They're not just always on. Um, but it's not so simple as just a light switch being on and off. You know, sometimes it's a dimmer switch, and there's like different amounts of a gene that could be produced. And sometimes it's a little more complicated than that. Um, <laughs> yeah, boiler up, Purdue reference, Ooh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I was from Indiana, what can I say? <laughs> and sometimes it's, you know, it's way more complicated. You saw those charts PZ was going up. There's so many genes that interact with each other that it's not just a gene being turned on or off. And then there's epigenetics. This is something we're hearing about in the media a lot today. It's a really new field and people are really interested in it. And I think the main thing to get about epigenetics, which just means um, um, uh, information in the genome outside of the sequence of DNA is that DNA is a physical object. It's a molecule. It's not just a string of letters that you're typing into a computer. And because of this, DNA has shape and form and you can change it. And so how one example of this works is here you have a DNA molecule and what DNA does is it binds to these proteins called histones, which basically pack the DNA, DNA up more compactly. But histones only bind to certain spots. And there's way to change where these histones bind and how tightly they bind. And for example, if you have an area that's not bound to any histones, it's more likely that this gene is going to be transcribed and eventually turn into protein. But you can also make it where it's super packed up and you can't access the genes in here. And so this is one example of how epigenetics can actually basically turn on or off genes and regulate how the, the cell is producing protein. And one example of epigenetics that I find really interesting um, is one that affects about 50% of people in this room. You may not know about it. Uh, it's called X inactivation. So as you know, women have two X chromosomes. Men have an X and Y. But women basically then have a double dose of every gene on the X chromosome. And that's not so good generally. Um, you know, cells are really fine-tuned to have the right doses of genes. You don't want to willy-nilly duplicate things all the time because it's not always good to have extra. And so during development, uh, what happens is one of these X chromosomes is randomly inactivated. And so in every cell of a woman's body, you actually only have one X chromosome that is um, producing proteins from th those genes. And you can actually see this under a microscope. This is what they do when they just really want to simply figure out uh, the genetic sex of a person, uh, shows up as this thing called a bar body, which is this little black blob, and that's just a really crunched up X chromosome. So everyone in the room has this. And this is also what explains coat color and tortoise shell cat. So the genes for coat color are on the X chromosome. So what happens is if it's uh, heterozygote in that it has the gene for black and orange, it's the black, wherever the black X chromosome was turned on, you see black, and wherever the orange one was, you see orange. So that's why you have cats with that pattern. And so people ask, you know, 
God, I'm in the way. <laughs> Slides are too low. People ask, does this happen in humans? And sometimes it does. Um, but usually what happens is that it's so random that it averages out and you don't really see the trait because it's not affecting a particular cell. But sometimes it does get skewed. And this is important when you have traits like uh, color blindness or uh, cystic fibrosis that are X-linked traits that usually men get a lot more because women have the extra chromosome to make up for it. But if you happen to get your X chromosome deactivated in the wrong tissue type, you can actually have the effects. So there are women who just by dumb luck got most of the cells in their eyes to have the wrong X chromosome with the defect and they're colorblind even though they have one of the good copies. And I think another thing people are really interested in is things like gene therapy and actually it's sort of like the future genetics and engineering genes. Um, and this does work. Um, it's still a really new field, but there have been a number of cases where we think this is going to help people out a lot. And basically gene therapy is just when you're inserting a functional gene into the genome to make up for some sort of defective gene that people have. Uh, this is not like Bioshock, but it plays this game. <laughs> like I'm glad they used the word plasmid because that's at least somewhat biological, but it doesn't quite work that way. Everyone else just, just ignore that. Uh, <laughs> uh, but there are a lot of limitations. Uh, like I said, it only works for single gene defects. And most traits have lots and lots of genes working on a certain trait. Um, it's not just one gene. And so you have to have a pretty simple thing to be able to fix it. Um, the other thing is that, you know, the way that they deliver these genes are usually through viruses. And, you know, think of what your body does when you get a cold. You have an immune response. So sometimes you get sick in response to these viruses that are trying to help you. And finally, um, there's a chance of inducing a tumor when you do this because what these viruses are doing are basically just inserting these genes into your genome, most of the time kind of willy-nilly because it's not as refined yet. Um, and there's a probability that it's going to insert the gene into another gene, a very important gene that stops you from getting cancer. Um, so this is one of the big drawbacks right now to gene therapy and something we have to really um, figure out how to overcome. But there are some things that won't change your DNA. Um, I just want to go over these because I, I see them everywhere, like skin wash. Um, <laughs> this will not change your DNA. Um, and sadly, I see this everywhere. Makeup will not change your DNA either. Uh, the sad thing was I just went on Google image search and put makeup DNA and I found about 50 examples of things like this where people are saying this will rejuvenate your DNA. It's like, I'm pretty sure scientists would like to know how you're fixing people's DNA so we could like go fix cancer, but you know, th thanks. Because having like healthy young skin is much more important. Uh, <laughs> but it's not just advertising. Um, sin apparently changes your DNA. <laughs> So this is a slide from the Creation Museum in Kentucky. Um, yeah, I know some of you went to the one here. I actually missed out and I, I don't feel bad because I want to keep my brain cells. <laughs> um, but this is a, a slide explaining where Cain got his wife and his wife was his sister, but the way they say this is okay was that before the fall of mankind, people were genetically perfect. I don't know what that means. <laughs> There's, no such thing as genetically perfect, but the, the premise was that there were no negative mutations, and once Adam sinned, sin starts causing mutations. <laughs> I'm, I'm just gonna move on. Um, <laughs> but Jesus can also not <laughs> change your DNA. I don't know if you guys saw this video. Uh, I didn't have time to embed it, but there's this pastor who was telling a story of how a woman who had committed a lot of crimes, they finally went back and started doing DNA testing on them. They found that her DNA matched the DNA of the crime scene. And while she was sitting in jail waiting for another trial to come up for a different case, she, she found Jesus, she got baptized, she became a true believer, she was saved. And then once they collected her DNA, again, for, to run the example, that magically her DNA didn't even match her DNA from before. <laughs> yeah, they don't like say who the woman is. There's like no citations, obviously. <laughs> yeah, that, that could be a case. Uh, so I'll, I'll go off on a tangent for a second. So someone said it might be chimeric. Um, and that actually does happen occasionally. So there are real life chimeras out there where there are some people where they have multiple parts of their body. That the genomes actually do differ because a lot of times what happens is you're going to start off as a cell that's trying to divide and, or no, it started off as two twins, separate twins, and you basically merge back together and end up forming one person because it ends up 
happening so early on in development. And so, you'll, so you have a person with like two different genomes in them. And that is very rare. It could be what happened here, or it could be a crazy Christian person <laughs> making stuff up. But uh, that's, that's, that's my hypothesis. So how are you, unique are you? I'm talking about you know, testing for uh, criminal cases. So humans are actually 99.9% .9 similar. Um, and there's more variation within races than between. Um, there are some differences between um, different racial groups in like Africa versus Europe versus Asia. But when you look, Africa is actually the most diverse uh, group. Uh, there's way more variation within Africa than other populations. But humans are actually not that diverse compared to other species. Uh, this is because we had a bottleneck back in the day. And I don't mean Adam and Eve. <laughs> um, uh, there was a time where, you know, the humans living on the savanna got down to way lower numbers, and that's where all humans came from. We very rapidly expanded. And so we have this, what's called a small effective population size. So even though there are 7 billion people on the planet now, it's really like there are only 10,000 because we're so genetically undiverse compared to what we would expect for that big of a population, which is kind of surprising. But we are still very diverse, and that's why we can use genetics and forensics. <laughs> because even though we're 99.9% .9 similar, that 0.1% means a lot when your genome is 6 billion base pairs long. So there are a lot of differences between people. But one of the problems with genetics and forensics previously that is getting fixed was um, problem with a lot of population genetics that is, has been around for a while in that, you know, a lot of the genetics is done in, ge genetic research is done in the United States and in Europe. And so the populations that are being sampled are predominantly European of descent. So a lot of white people in these studies. And it's really underrepresented from other minorities. And what happens, what used to happen is uh, someone from my department actually did a study, this was before I got there, where they were looking at these genetic markers used to do criminal cases. And what they found was the markers were great when you're trying to identify Europeans, but when you're looking at people of African descent, they actually weren't diverse enough because the Africans were more similar with those particular markers. So it was more likely to falsely convict people of African American descent. Yeah. <laughs> Not good. <laughs> um, so they actually have been developing a lot of new markers now that pr take into account diversity that are in different populations, because there are differences. And the big question I also always get is nature versus nurture. You know, what's the cause between certain traits? Uh, so there's a thing that gets thrown a around a lot called heritability, um, that people just think it's usually think that it's how much of a trait within an individual is caused by a gene, like how much of something is genetic. But that's not quite what it is. Um, so heritability is the proportion of variation of a trait within a whole population that is due to genetic variation between individuals, which is not the same as how much of a trait within a person instead of a population is caused by genetics. I know this is hard to understand. The, the main example to give is if everyone in this room had black hair, even though there's a gene causing black hair, there would be no heritability because there's no variation. So it's just talking about what can we, if we're looking at genomes and looking at differences, how much can those differences explain the differences in what we see? And it's surprising how many traits in humans actually have really high heritability. So for example, height is about 80 to 90 percent heritable, intelligence is 50 to 80 percent. Nicotine dependence, about 70%, and things like autism and other diseases are up to 90%. So this is surprising to a lot of people because a lot of these are behavioral, but there is really high heritability in these traits. But there's this thing that's plaguing geneticists nowadays called missing heritability, in that when we do studies looking for the genes that are contributing to these traits, we can only explain a really small percentage of heritability right now. So if something's 80% heritable, we might understand 5% of that 80%. And this is because what we've been looking at is just the sequence, the A, T, Cs, and Gs, and looking at the differences between those. But there's so much more to the genome than that. Uh, I already talked about epigenetics a bit, and people are looking at that a lot now. Um, there are also these things called copy number variants, which are basically, you can have huge chunks of your genome deleted or duplicated. And that's been really hard to study until recent technology, and this is stuff that 
um, people are doing a lot of now. So even everyone in this room has parts of their genomes that are deleted that aren't deleted in other people. Um, and finally, again, interaction between genes. If you're just looking for one gene that's different, you might miss the fact that if this gene has this mutation and this gene has this mutation, then you get a trait. Um, and that's just so much more complex to look at and people are, again, looking at in the future. And this is my biggest pet peeve. <laughs> so when the media says, scientists found the gene for X. <sighs> again, usually it explains a really tiny fraction of heritability. And that's if the study is actually any good. Um, yeah, so if like there's a gene for being a dickhead, you should probably take that into account. <laughs> that it's probably not as good as science. Um, but the thing is, sensationalist findings are way more likely to be reported even if the research is total crap, unfortunately. Um, so when you see things like the liberal gene, or the gay gene, or whatever, insert whatever social, socially interesting thing here, take it with a grain of salt. Um, because human behavior is very complex. And there may be things that contribute to um, people acting in a way that may make you make, be more liberal. Um, uh, homosexuality does have a lot of research behind it that there's probably some genetic basis, but there's no gay gene, there's not one. Um, so take it with a grain of salt when you see these things. So how do you spot the BS when it comes to these sort of studies? One, look at the sample size. Um, you know, I think we might be talking about statistics a little more in the afternoon. Um, but when you see a study and it says they looked at 20 people, that is not enough for genetics. Um, there is so much variation within humans that you're not going to catch the differences and you're probably just gonna get dumb luck that something stuck out. You really need thousands of individuals in a study before you can say anything. And even then, you need to repeat that study a couple times because it depends on the population. A lot of these studies also are only looking at Europeans again. So you have to, even if they find a gene for, um, that makes you uh, more likely to have high blood pressure, for example, that may be only in a European population if they find Europeans, but you can't necessarily have that same trait popping up in Africans. Look at what journal it's published in. Um, there are such things that, as crappy scientific journals. Um, there's a difference between science and the Indiana Journal of Squirrel Social Biology, okay? <laughs> there's, <laughs> you know, what happens in academia is you usually shoot high, you try to get into one of those like really good journals, and if you get rejected, kind of go down the ladder a bit, and sometimes, if your study is really terrible, you end up way at the bottom. And so, you should take it with a grain of salt if someone can't get into a better journal. Um, and one way to look into this, if you're not a scientist and you're not just familiar with what's a good journal or not, is to look at this thing called impact factor. You can just Google this up online, and it's actually a fairly good me measurement of how good a journal is. So higher impact factor, um, better journal. And be wary of behavior and sex. So, the science, Science in the news cycle tends to go a little crazy, especially, you know, if it's explaining, you know, the gay gene or the liberal gene. And I think this is especially true when we come up with maybe apocalyptic claims, like, oh, this gene's going to kill you if you have it. Um, and I think the really good example of this is genetically modified organisms, where if I just did a Google image search, this is what I found. <laughs> There were about 10 more injecting into fruit things that I did not include. <laughs> um, and there are some, you know, there are some things to be careful about when we're dealing with genetically modified organisms. Um, and that, you know, sometimes we don't know the long-term effects of genes, or sometimes genes can go wild in a population you might not want them to. But there's way too much hysteria about them in the same way. Because, you know, you know what's a genetically mo modified organism? this corn before it's anything injected in this. It's just that we genetically modified it over a couple thousand years through agriculture and selecting genes instead of just inserting that gene to begin with. So just, again, take it with a grain of salt when anyone's trying to say the world's going to end or all of our food is going to poison you with its, with its genes that it didn't have before. <laughs> and a couple other ways to spot the BS. Um, if you're a scientist, go to the primary literature. Go look up that paper, because sometimes there is a good paper, and it does just get totally misrepresented by the media. And sometimes you read the th media, and it looks great, and I look up the paper, and I'm like, this is total crap. But obviously, not everyone here is a scientist. Um, if you're at least, like, fairly well-versed in science, um, most papers have this section called the comment section, where they'll write up a more, uns like, less 
technical version of the paper in a general article that's still much better written than a random science journalist is going to do. So for example, Nature has a comment section, and those are really good articles. Read blogs written by scientists. Um, this is actually what I do. I love reading things like Freya, Why Evolution is True, Not Exactly Rocket, Rocket Scientists. Because these guys are scientists, they're pretty good. Their BS sensors are really well tuned, so they can find the problems for you most of the time when they're explaining a paper. And if you're lucky, ask a scientist friend. My parents call me up all the time now when they see something on the news with a new gene. They're like, Jen, this is crap. You know, like, is this real? Should I go te get tested for this? Usually the answer is, just ignore it, mom and dad, and <laughs> don't worry. But if you do have a scientist friend, ask them, and they'll try to explain it to you, hopefully. Oh, and one more thing. Um, so this is a little plug for a book. This is actually a professor at my department, but I've read this book and it's really good. Um, it's called Genetics, Twists of Fate. It's a great book if you just want introductory genetics. Um, it's meant for people who maybe haven't had a biology class in a really long time, or want to just learn more about genetics, and it's full of great uh, stories about how certain genes were discovered, and personal stories, and, as well as going through the details. And so if you're really interested, the best way to spot the BS is just become more educated about it. And the final thing is that what everyone asks me is personalized genetics. Is it worth it? Should I go to 23andMe? Should I get sequenced? Should I find out all my variants? Uh, not really. <laughs> um, I'll just read this comment because I think it's a perfect example of why not. Uh, did my genetic test come back? Yes, sit down. Is it bad news? What are my risk factors? We can't be sure about this, but we've analyzed genes on several of your chromosomes, and it's hard to avoid the conclusion. At some point, your parents had sex. <laughs> oh, God, stay calm. It's possible it was just once. I, I need to be alone. <laughs> <coughs> <coughs> and honestly, this is a pretty good summary, su summary of personalized genetics, because right now, it can't tell you that much. I think maybe in 10, 15 years, it's going to be great, and that you'll actually be able to do something about your results. But right now, it's not worth your money. Um, for example, most of the things that they're comparing you to are based on um, what are called uh, gen uh, genome-wide association studies, where they're looking for these genes that cause these traits. And most of them are pretty crummy. Uh, most of them are small sample size and kind of crappy journals and aren't going to tell you that much. They're not as good of science. They're just kind of soaking up anything they can do to add more features to the website. Um, and even the good ones, which they're out there, um, they usually only result in slight differences in susceptibility. So it's like, wow, I have a 1% more chance of having high blood pressure now. Am I really going to change my diet when I only had like a 3% chance to begin with? Um, and I think most people know they're not really going to change, overhaul their life because you have a 1% chance more of something. But there are some exceptions. Uh, well, one's for shits and giggles. Um, I got mine just because I'm a geneticist. They actually give you some of the data back, so I wanted to run my own tests on it. <laughs> um, but if you really care about ancestry, like where your, your ancestors came from um, and following your, either your mitochondrial DNA or your Y chromosome, it's great for that. Um, things like 23andMe actually have much better um, systems for looking at that than just like a simple mitochondrial kit. So it's pretty cool if you want to know, like, I came from this tribe from this part of the world. Um, and it's also kind of cool if you're adopted. If you know nothing about your history, it's great. Because the reason why I would tell most people not to bother with this is because you actually are much easier to predict what you're susceptible to just looking at your parents and grandparents and seeing what sort of things happen to them. But some genetic tests are useful. I don't want to make it seem like this genetics thing is pointless. <laughs> that would not be good for my job. <laughs> for one, infant screening is really important. Now. Every state in the United States has at least some test that when you're born, they will go test genes for it. So things like phenylketonuria, which is a really terrible disease if you don't catch it early. It uh, causes mental retardation. But if you catch it early, all you have to do is change your diet and you can actually almost totally avoid it. And so there are a lot of tests like this where if you catch it early through a genetic test, there are things you can do about it, so we should be testing. And so lots of states have dozens of these tests they do once you're born. But there are some tests that are useful for adults. Um, probably the best example are the breast cancer genes, BRCA1 and BRCA2, which don't explain all of breast cancer, but they are the major contributor, contributors. Um, and these tests are good to get, I would say, if you have a family history of breast cancer. So if you have multiple people in your family who have it, or people who had it really early on, so like in their 20s or 30s, not in your 60s, where people just sort of randomly get cancer because you've reached a certain age where your genome is falling apart a little bit. Um, and 
These are important because if you find you do have the allele in these genes that cause breast cancer, you can take preventative measures. There's actually things you can do. You can get mammograms more often. And so it's really important that for, for cases like this, it's a good idea to get it. Um, another example of this is for a drug called warfarin. Does anyone know what warfarin is? Yeah, okay, I, yeah, good enough. It's a, it's a blood thinner. And the thing with warfarin, though, is it's really hard to judge what sort of dose people need on warfarin because people metabolize it way differently. Some only need something like two milligrams, some need 16. The problem is it's also really bad if you overdose on warfarin. So you don't want to just give people the average eight because you're going to be overdosing half of the population. And we actually have this gene figured out really well in that if we look at your variant, we can pretty much tell what milligram of warfarin you should get. And if this test was cheap, we could tell you exactly what would need to be prescribed. Um, but this is not happening. And one, it's not happening because the doctors don't really trust it because we can't do um, a study uh, an actual medical study proving it because then you need a control where you're not giving people warfarin and they're basically dying, or you're giving people warfarin that's overdosing and they die, which is not very ethical. Um, <laughs> the government did not approve that study. <laughs> um, and so they don't really accept it for that. But the other thing is these tests aren't cheap because drug industries just rather come up with a different type of blood thinner they can give everyone instead of warfarin. So warfarin is actually being phased out. But things like this are gonna come up more in the future where we can figure out what dosage you need for genes. There we go. Um, so, you know, the future genetics. I, genetics is only becoming more relevant, so I think it's really important that everyone have at least a basic understanding of it. And studies are getting even better. And so, even though now I'm saying stuff like personal genome testing, wait on it. You know, five, ten years from now, I'll be like, why haven't you done this yet? This could be really helpful. And once you get into genetics, you start seeing examples of it everywhere in your life. And it becomes really cool. And, you know, like if your cat is chewing up your iPhone wire, <laughs> you look at your cute little kitty and be like, oh, look, your genes for dark fur are temperature regulated and only your extremities have it. Ah, and it's like, I hate you. Why did you do this? <laughs> Why? <laughs> or, you know, if you're in the airport flying to Skepticon, you start having, like, pareidolia for <laughs> um, DNA sequences. I, like, I got sadly excited when I saw that, and that just says how my brain <laughs> is primed for this sort of thing. So you start seeing genetics everywhere. And with that, I think I have time for maybe a couple questions if Lauren's not here, so I'm just going to do it anyway. So thank you guys. And I'll take questions. <laughs> you might just have to holler because I don't think. All right, go ahead. Uh, that's true to an extent in that um, we know that certain, oh, I'm sorry, yeah, you guys can't hear anything. Um, basically what he's saying that when you're doing a long-term process of agronomy, you have basically evolution working to make sure, sure certain genes are safe instead of just inserting a gene and not really knowing what the long-term effects are going to be. Um, and that is one of the concerns that we don't know if we just insert something what the long-term effects are going to be right off the bat. Um, but most of these genes that are inserting are either genes from other plants that have already overgone evolution there. Um, and you also have to remember that evolution isn't perfect. Um, anyone with, when they wake up and they have stiff knees and stiff back can tell you that, um, that sometimes evolution isn't going towards perfection or what's most right um, or most useful, just using what is useful at that moment and what it can work with. So I think you can sort of make the argument either way that, you know, you, we, we do need to be careful when we're doing this. It's not just willy-nilly inserting anything and throwing them out into fields. Um, but I think that um, people are a lot more scared of it than they should be. Uh, yeah, right there. Sure, so if you just Google impact factor, there's a website 
they'll list them. And if you know something was published in a journal, you can just search for it, and it'll tell you a number that says, like, this impact factor is 1.5. Um, and they list, they give a rank of basically journals by impact factor. So science and nature are some of the highest, uh, uh, PNAS uh, plus biology, things like that. I'm more familiar with the biology ones, obviously. Um, and you can see, like, oh, this one's actually doing pretty good. It's on the top or it's in the middle. And this one is, like, not even listed. And <laughs> it's probably not even real. Oh, this is a creationist journal. What have I done? Um, <laughs> and they do have journals. They just kind of, like, put, like, a PDF online. Um, <laughs> so you have to be careful. But, yeah, so if you just Google impact factor, and it, um, it's basically based on um, how many times papers are cited or cited by other papers or... Um, how hard it is to get into a journal, and, and factors like that. And it's actually been shown to be a pretty good predictor of how good a journal is. Yeah. Sure. Um, you, you mentioned that, you know, pretty much share 99.9% .9 of, of the things that each other, but then you also say, I share roughly 50% of the genome. Okay, so he asked, what's the difference when I say um, humans share 99.9% .9 of the genome with each other, but you only share 50% with your brother? Um, good question. I should have clarified that. Um, when I say you share 50% with your brother, I mean, if you're comparing genomes, if you look at the differences, 50% of those different sites will be different. But they'll be this, um, God, that's not <laughs> explaining it all, is it? Okay. So when you're looking at, this would be great if I had like a chalkboard, I can go to like scientist mode. <clears throat> um, so when you're looking at a general population, and you're just looking at sites in a genome, so specific letters, and say how many of those are different, if you look at every human on Earth, there will be 0.1% of the genome has a difference in it when you're looking at a specific site. But when you're looking between a sibling, when you're only looking at different sites, you share 50% of those different sites. Does that make more sense? I saw a nod, so I'm just going to assume that made more sense. All right, back there standing up, yeah. Fine. Yeah, sure. No, that's really, that's not a dumb question at all. It's really good. Um, genetic ethics have gone way better. Um, I know someone was asking me, like, you know, back in the day we had Henrietta Lacks. We just basically stole, or if anyone read that book, we just, like, took her DNA without asking, and now, or not her DNA, her cells without asking, and now her cancer cells are used in pretty much every lab in the country. Um, but that was a long time ago in terms of science where our ethics weren't so good. Now it's very strict what people do with your DNA. So if you're signing up for a study um, and you're only signing up because you want to help them figure out skin pigmentation, they literally, they, like someone sitting in a lab can sit there and look at your other genes, but they can't announce it, they can't tell anyone, they can't tell you if they find something different, and they can definitely not publish it in a journal. So um, one of the examples of this is a big problem when you're doing um, these things called trio studies, where you have a mom, a dad, and a child, and they're trying to look at, you know, any maybe new mutations in a child that it can explain why the child has this terrible disease that the parents don't have, or something like that. That's the simple explanation. Um, and what they find is about 10% of the fathers are not the dads of these children. <laughs> but the thing is, they can't tell the parents, obviously, and but they can't even publish on it. So you're not going to find a study saying, we were doing this study looking for this, but we also found this. So it's very limited what they can do. So it's, um, if they're taking your DNA, DNA you know what it's going to be used for. Yep. Do we still have time? No. Okay. She's cutting me off. I'm sorry, guys. Um, I'm leaving in like an hour for the airport, but if you have any questions, you can catch me right now. <laughs> Thank you. Okay.